Let's read now Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to come in at verse 12. Colossians 3 and 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, bearing one another, sorry, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. Be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there's no respect of persons. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. May God bless his word to us. Are you reading Colossians every day? No, please don't all put up your hands at once. Please, I don't want a, a sudden draft to occur in the building. I, I did ask you. In fact, I, I did make an, an assignment. And I know that some have. And I know that all of you intend to do it more often. So I would encourage you to go back to the beginning and you can just see there, Paul's so pleased about believers, and they're saved, and he wants them to know the greatness of the Lord Jesus, the discernment of his greatness. And then says, Paul, here's how great he is. Here's how, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, by him were all things created. And you just go down that, and you just stand back, and you say, he's great. He's great. Declaration of his greatness. Then Paul says, I'm going to dedicate my life to his greatness. I'm going to go about preaching. I'm going to go about teaching. I want everybody to know how great Christ is. Because if they know how great Christ is, it'll just mold them and change them and help them. So just be perfect in Christ. And that's the defense of his greatness. And then you notice things changed a little bit last night. We started to go into this topic here that's very, very practical, and we tried to point out to you what it is to be, well, the more you die, the more you live. The more you live, the more you die. And I hope some of you got some of that, so that you're able to say to yourself, I actually need to die. Oh, I'm dead all right in terms of in terms of position, I was dead in sins, and now I'm alive in Christ. And God actually saw me that I died on the cross. So there's nothing more demanded of me as far as any laws or anything. And then rose again in Christ. And that's the way God saw me. So I believe that I'm going to walk now as a child of God. God reckons me to be that. Delivered from all the old and welcomed into the new. So I reckon it too. In fact, I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life. I'm going to live the rest of my life in devotion to the greatness of Christ. And so that's why we tried to look at some of these things. Mortify our members as to all these terrible, terrible immoral sins and put off all this anger and that. Now we're, well, I'm going to just tell you tonight we're going to get dressed. 
tonight we're going to get dressed. I, I don't know if it's ever happened in a wonderful, beautiful place like, like Perth. But a woman goes and she flings open the wardrobe, absolutely bunged full of all sorts of fabric and says, I have nothing to wear. I don't know if that's ever happened on this side of the Atlantic. I can tell you, there are wardrobes absolutely jammed and all those poor women standing there in utter despair. Well, it's easy being a man. You just put on what you threw over the chair last night. <laughs> and wise wives change it, you know, sneak in an extra shirt. And whether the socks need changed this week or not, you put in a new pair and away a man goes. Well, it's easy being a man. It's difficult being a woman. I know that. Okay. So I'm not, I would never want to mock or make fun of such things, but I do want all of you to dress up properly. And I'm talking about the spiritual because we are going to be told in verse 12 of Colossians chapter three, that we're to get dressed, put on therefore. It reads a lot like Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, doesn't it? After the great exposition of what the gospel is. Man's and all, man and all of his sin. Christ and all that he's done. The Christian now and all of his power. Don't forget Israel. All the promises are the same to them. I beseech ye therefore. And all that's gone before. To present your bodies. That was Romans 12, a living sacrifice. I used to think it meant a dead one. And I was wondering, well, how am I supposed to die for the Lord? And how it's not to be a dead sacrifice, it's to be a living one. And that's actually a little bit harder because that means every day, constantly offering yourself to God in a very willful way. I know there's often a crisis moment, but I tell you what. These are things that we are to get on now each and every day. So this isn't now presenting our bodies so much as it is get dressed, put on, put on. We're just going to take a day in the life of a Christian. How we're just going to go down here and we're going to start in the morning. And quite often we would look in the mirror and we just think, well, brace your shoulders. And we're going to get ourselves, try to get the hair, both of them going the right direction and, and open the eyes up a little bit and splash some water on. Uh, and you get, and then it's, we've got to put on things and we're going to face this old world, put on the things. And I'm now not talking about whether it's, uh, I, I don't even know brand names anymore. Armani, is that a name? Well, good. I hit that one right. I now know a second one. I'm not going to tell you what this one is. Right? I hope Walmart is a good brand. Okay. Or TK Maxx. Or I, I don't know. Anyway, I'm not talking about that. I'm now talking about what you're to, you and I are to put on as new creatures in Christ. Put on, therefore. No. There's th I want to tell you about three things to appreciate, seven things to demonstrate, and two things to elevate. Right. You're wide awake now. Three things to appreciate. Listen to them. Elect of God. Holy beloved now if that doesn't describe a christian i don't know what does three things to deeply appreciate and you appreciate who you are and the things then you're putting on will seem a lot easier he says you are chosen there's the wisdom of god you are the object of god's choice and every single believer is able to say in their hearts and know it and say i am elect of god God has fastened his purposes and his will upon me. I'm one of his chosen. That's tremendous. I, I don't know. I don't know. Am I allowed to mention this? And <clears throat> just erase this from the tapes. And But on Monday, there was a fellow who was chosen <clears throat> last for the football team. And it wasn't Joe. It was me. but I was still chosen, but I just barely got in. Today, I think I was second last. I don't know. There was a little toddler that came running in. and uh, I, But I'm still chosen. Oh, brethren and sisters, you are chosen of God. Never, ever forget that. And all that means is that there is an eternity where God dwells, where he makes his choices. And I tell you this, when God chooses, it shall be done. You are the object of God's choice. You're also the object of God's cleansing. 
you're holy. This is not just the wisdom of God. This is the work of God. You have now been cleansed. There's a verse in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6 and verse 11, is it? That absolutely thrills my heart every time I read it. And such were some of you. There was a big long list of sins. But ye are washed. That takes care of all the past. But ye are sanctified. That just sets me. That's like our word here, holy. That just fits me for the present. But ye are justified. That means there is nothing in the future that will ever be raised as a charge against me. I am completely saved. Past cleansed. Present sanctified. For the future and forever justified. You know what justification means, right? It means that 10,000 years from now, God will not come to you and say, I found something in your, your history. I found a charge against you that can stick. To be justified isn't just meaning that your past is cleared. It means that your future is guaranteed. There'll never be another charge laid against you. That is justification. I actually did not understand justification too well for a while because justification meant to me that the margins on my paper, you know, were both in a straight line. That was what word or whatever word perfect of way back in the 1980s, right? It would tell us that that's justification, right? And you justify your margin. No, no, I didn't understand what justify really. I didn't just, it didn't sink into my heart until I learned Japanese. So if you want to know what justification means, you can either listen to me now or go and learn Japanese. And I read that they don't have a word for justification. So they just put in a couple of words. Gito. Righteously declared. Declared righteous. That's what it means. It means you're declared righteous. When you trusted Christ, God says you're righteous. And it's a declaration. It's not taking the righteousness of Christ and putting it into your... It's, it's just the death of Christ was sufficient to clear you of everything and to justify you and to declare you righteous. And so you read Romans chapter 4 and it's all about justification. Well, I was just reading down through the Japanese Bible and it's just, oh yeah, gito mi tomeraremas, gito mi tomeraremas, gito mi tomeraremas, which means a whole lot to you, I realize, but it means a lot to me. Because I look at that first character, Gi, righteousness. A lamb. A knife. An altar. And I put that together and that's the Japanese word for righteousness. Isn't that amazing? I'll tell you what's more amazing. You're justified. Well, beloved, you're not only the object of God's choice, the object of God's cleansing, you are also the object of God's compassion. He loves you. And so when he says here, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, I hope he has your attention now. I hope you would understand that in all the wisdom of God and the work of God and the will of God, that you, just you, are now about to get dressed. Oh, you say, I think the, there better be some decent robes to come on me now. I mean, look at me. I am a child of, of, of God. I, I am beloved of him. I, I, am, I am an object of his cleansing, an object of his purposes and his choice. I, there must be some good clothes coming. Yes, there are seven things. Look at them. I hope you enjoy putting these on. Put them on every morning and your wife will just really appreciate it. Look at it. It says here, bowels of mercies. That just simply means tenderness. Tenderness. You, you would understand. You might wonder in the Bible, why does it talk about bowels of mercies? Well, because that's where our feelings are. I don't know about you, but you know how sometimes you just, you don't have the guts for it. You're not actually talking about your large bowel or small one for that matter. And I won't go any further because I don't know anatomy enough, but you're not actually talking about what's going on in here. 
What you're talking about is this, this is where your feelings are. You often feel things right here, don't you? Sometimes there's even butterflies in there, believe it or not. And, and sometimes it's just like a Bosch washing machine in there. And you're just all churned up. This is where your feelings are. He says, I want you to have bowels of mercies. He says, I just want you to be full of tenderness. Kindness. This is what I said the other night. Being nice. Being nice. Has anyone here ever had someone tell you, you know, close to you, that says, can't you just be nice? You know, we don't want you to go and climb Mount Everest. I don't even want you to go and buy a Rolls Royce. I, you know, all I want you to do is be nice. So enough about the husbands. <clears throat> Kindness. Do you know what I've experienced here in Perth? There's a lot of kind people here. I really appreciate it. I really do. People that are just kind. They, they just see things that need to be done. They, they see things that need to be said here. You know, they, they know what needs to be said. They, they, they just, just know exactly. And I look, I even see it. I even see it after um, you might say there was a little bit of a, a hustle and bustle and just a little bit of tussle or whatever, whatever it is they do when they're chasing that little inflatable thing around the field. And, uh, and, and then you see a bit of kindness, even when I'm flattened completely on the ground, a nice hand has reached out. Oh, welcome up to the real world, you know? And he didn't even say old fellow, you know, just welcome up. And oh, I'm not talking about that now. We're talking about a kindness that just recognizes just the weakness in others and is just able to come and make up for it. And our brethren and sisters, do you know what it is to be kind? I'm sure you do. Let's do it more, shall we? Let's do it more. Let's be, let's be more kind. Tenderness, kindness. It says here, humbleness of mind. This is right thinking. Sometimes we get the idea of humbleness. Remember, these are clothing that we're putting on in the morning. So you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror and you say, well, on with the tenderness. On with the kindness. Well, you say it's going to be a good day. On with the humbleness of mind. This, by the way, does not mean you go around saying, I am absolutely no good. You probably aren't, but that's nothing to do with this. You maybe can't do certain things. And I remember, <laughs> you, will, you will forgive a personal reference, but my wife said to, we were only in Japan a very short time, and, and my wife in one of her, just the way spontaneous moments, she won't mind me saying, <clears throat> I trust, uh, she says um, to Mr. Curry, she says, you know, we are not worthy. We are not worthy to be called to come and serve the Lord in Japan. We are not worthy. He says, I know you're not, but no one else would come. <laughs> <laughs> No, this, is, this is not false humility that we need. We don't need any false humility. This is right thinking. This is right thinking, a right assessment. If you can do it, brother, do it. If you can do it, sister, do it. Don't let a false humility get in your way and say, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. If you can't do it, don't do it, perhaps. But just have a right assessment of things. A humbleness of mind. We'd go right back into Philippians in chapter two, wouldn't we? Let this mind be in you. Whose mind are we to imitate? It's the mind of Christ, we know. But whenever we're to prefer or to more highly esteem others than yourselves, what does that mean? Does that mean that I have to think he or she is better at that than I am? That, that's, not, that's not the point. It's more, if you're going to esteem others better than yourself, it's recognizing really they're more worthy of God's attention than, than I am. They're more worthy of blessing than I am. That, that's a big difference, isn't it? Because some of you are absolutely fantastic cooks. So please don't mope about and you go around saying, oh, I can't cook, I can't cook. Get into the kitchen and cook up a storm and invite me over. And that'll just keep us all happy. No, I, you, so please, this is nothing about your abilities or anything. This is just having that humbleness of mind. Esteeming others is more worthy of God's attention, but I'm still going to, we're going to learn more. We're still going to do whatever we can with all of our might. Just, just think of a bit of right thing. Meekness. Do you know what meekness is? Um, I'm not sure I do. I'm sorry. 
I can give you some definitions if you like. But I'm learning on this one. So you can pray for me more intelligently. I'm trying to get this one right. Do you know the difference between a hurricane and a breeze? Oh, you say yes. Well, they're both the movement of air, aren't they? The both of them are the movement of air. But one comes in and absolutely blows you over, and the other comes in and refreshes. The breeze is the meekness. It doesn't come in with all your might and all of your power and all of the use of all of your abilities and bowl a person over. It's just coming in with your strength under control so that you are a refreshment to others and not a typhoon. It's like medicine, isn't it? I don't know very much about medicine. All I know is that the doctor never tells, tells me, take one tablet tonight, and if you think it works, take the rest of the bottle in the morning. He doesn't say that. It might, it might do me a lot of damage. But when I take the medicine just as I need it, just the right dose, as you will, it's of tremendous good. What am I doing? I'm recognizing the power in it. I'm recognizing the strength of it, but I'm not giving it all at once. There's two examples of what I'm going to suggest to you is meekness. It's your strength right under control. And it's just delivering enough to be a refreshment, but not too much of you to make yourself a nuisance. Proud looking or a bit of arrogance, pushing over. You see, some of us need to just work on that. Just, just to hold back a bit more, just to hold back. I heard a man shouting a number of times this afternoon, time, time, time. I finally said, what do you mean by time? Because I thought time meant he either is looking for it, it's currently 2.45, or he was meaning time out. So I stopped immediately every time he shouted time. So finally I said, what do you mean? He says, take your time. Ah, I understand. But he says, if I shouted, take your time, it'd be too late. So I just shout time. Well, I knew what he was meaning eventually. But I'm going to say that meekness is taking your time. Just, just go a little bit gentle. Just a bit gentle. It's not all about you, you know. So when you're putting on your clothes in the morning, I mean these ones, your tenderness, your kindness, your humbleness, your meekness, all under control, your long-suffering. There's going to be circumstances today that are going to try your patience. Just be long-suffering. Your Lord was. Oh, he demonstrated it continually. Oh, how long-suffering he was. How would you like it to be with disciples that never get it? They never seem to understand. And I can take you to, what is it, the middle of Mark's gospel and Mark chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 10. And he begins to tell them about something that's so precious to him. And he begins to tell them about the cross. And Peter says, not so, Lord. Oh. The Lord then begins to tell them about the cross again another time. And what are they doing? They're not even listening. I wonder who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And then in the next chapter, he tells them about the cross again. And Mrs. Zebedee marches up and says, I hope my boys get a big place. The Lord certainly was long-suffering, wasn't he? He was forbearing. He was long-suffering. Maybe sometimes long-suffering is more the idea of circumstances, whereas forbearing is the idea of people. Oh, you ever had to deal with people? Makes you want to live in a monastery, doesn't it? Makes you want to run away and hide. Some people are so awkward. And some people are a little bit hard to get. So maybe they don't understand. That's why. Maybe they actually don't think like you do. Maybe, just maybe, they have a different point of view. That's very awkward for you when you know everything, isn't it? It's just so annoying whenever you know all the answers and other people just don't listen, isn't it? Well, maybe, just maybe, in all of these little quirks and quirks, and the, what was that wee word I was told? Something about my idiosyncrasies. As if I would have any of those. I hardly know what the word means, and I definitely can't spell it. 
but I do understand that each one of us have little things that can rub us the wrong way. Do you know what is really good? If you put on the clothing in the morning that says, well, I'm just going to forbear one another. I'm just, I'm just going to get along with my brethren. In fact, when they say something a little bit wrong, you know how it is. Someone looks at you and gives you a really a big scowl. You have two choices, brother. You have two choices. You can take it to heart and say, that person doesn't like me. And this is this assembly is not very good because of that brother and, or that sister and that, and they've just screwed up their face at me. And I don't like that. You can think that if you want, or here's what I do. I say, oh dear, the poor soul, her teeth are sore. And there she is. She's in such pain. The poor doll, uh, poor darling. The, <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. And there she is. We can take offense at lots of things, can't we? Or we can just understand they've got circumstances of their own and we're just going to live with them. We're going to forbear. And look, if any man have a quarrel, the idea there of not, of it's not really like a quarrel that you're getting at each other. It's the idea of a complaint. Oh, well, that's a lot easier because we don't really quarrel, do we? But we do complain. We do complain. We can complain about one another, actually, to be honest. If any man have a complaint against Dunny, what, what, what are you going to do when you have a complaint against someone? You've got a choice. You can go around and you can talk about it. You can talk to other people about how brother so-and-so, how sister so-and-so really is not doing this and not doing that. And you have a complaint against them or you can forgive them. Well, you say, I never forgive unless they say sorry. Really? What kind of an attitude is that? You forgive them in your heart. That way the issue is dealt with long ago. If they say sorry, then they can get on with their life too. But you get on with your life first by forgiving them in your heart. And just let it go. And with that attitude, I have forgiven. Well, Christ forgave you. So you imitate Christ. You say, I'm, uh, I'm not sure this wardrobe here, this wardrobe is um, it's a lot of clothes I'm not used to wearing. How are we doing on this? You're saying, well, I think the Armani suit looks a whole lot easier to put on. Mm -hmm. It is. In fact, if we put a fraction of the effort into putting on these seven things, as we do combing our hair and brushing our teeth and deciding what socks to wear, I tell you, we'd be a whole lot better. And this world wants us to concentrate all on our physical. And the Lord is saying, I want you to concentrate on your spiritual. And he says, I want you to dress up every morning. Oh, to be dressed like this. Dressed, put on therefore. Oh, he says, don't forget there's something else. There's some worthy accessories. Accessories. I don't really know what accessories are. There's a store called Accessorize. I know that. It's a dreadful place to get caught up in. And, uh, and there's all sorts of beads and bangles and baubles and bandanas. And there's, I don't, bling, blong, whatever they call it. It's everything's there. And you can just, and everything's accessorized. Well, I've just got one accessory. I've got two. But one's really the proper accessory. And the other one, well, I don't know what to call it. The first is the belt. That's what it says here. Oh, you see, it doesn't say belt. It says, yes, above all these things, on top of all these things, put on charity. Put on love, which is the bond of perfection. It's the belt of love. It's the belt. This will hold it all nicely together. I don't know about you, but sometimes things go flipping and flopping about and, and, and everything in the wind is blowing and everything. And there's nothing like a good belt, isn't there? A good belt to hold it all in together, get everything all trim and proper so it fits you. Because when you are going to be tender and kind and humble and meek and long-suffering and forbearing and forgiving, you want it to fit you and you want it to stay snug to you. So put on the belt of love. Interestingly enough, when I go to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14, you're to put on the belt first. And there it's the armor of God. And you put on the belt of truth. And you get that clicked in. And then you get the breastplate. And, and you've got the, the shoes. And you've got a sword and a, and a helmet. And you've got everything fitting together in the shield. And that's the armor of God with the belt of truth first. But this is what we're talking. is We're talking love just comes over it all. 
It's the bond. It's the bond of perfection. This is what completes the outfit every morning. And then because I was looking for a B and a P, I thought that the next one in chapter uh, 15, let the peace of God, here's the blanket of peace. And the reason why I call it a blanket is it just dampens everything nicely, just calms us down. So there you are, you're all dressed up. Maybe you're going to put the, put the shawl over your shoulders or whatever you're going to think of, of it. And he says, now listen, he says, you let the peace. Now, you might see in some translations, let the peace of Christ. I, I quite like that because this is all about Christ. There's the forgiveness of Christ in verse 13. Then there's the peace of Christ in verse 15. Then there's the word of Christ in verse 16. I think that matches well. But let the peace of God or let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. I want you to notice a couple, a few things about this. If you have the peace of Christ ruling in your hearts, it'll do you a whole lot of good. It'll just settle your own mind. I'm at peace with God. I'm right with God. Actually, if you're not right with God because you're sinning, you, you won't have this peace. It won't be presiding anywhere in you. We, we do need to live a holy life. We do need to live in such a way that there's such a harmony with God. Oh, that's where the greatest peace on earth can exist, is whenever it is in your soul at perfect peace with God. I'm not now speaking about peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That happened the moment that you trusted Christ and acknowledged the sacrifice of Christ as being for you and therefore being justified by faith. We have peace with God. It means God's not angry with you. I'm now talking about that practical peace that actually does exist. Now I'm going to put it to you this way. I have a spirit in me. It's me. And I have the Holy Spirit dwelling in me. If my spirit is not in harmony with the Holy Spirit, I have a war. But if I am in harmony with God, my spirit and the Holy Spirit are pleased to dwell together in a harmony, then I will have a peace. It goes actually beyond understanding. It goes beyond understanding the whys and the wherefores of our daily life. I tell you, if you can put your head down on your pillow at night and know that all is well between you and God, there is no peace like it. There's no peace like it. If you have a guilty conscience right now, you can get, you can get that corrected even tonight. You say that quick. Yes. If you're living in sin, you can stop it. You have a wrong relationship, you can sever it. You've got something that's defiling you, you can cancel it. Subscriptions can be canceled, you know. Devices can be controlled, you know. Relationships can be curbed, you know. But we should recognize that we don't have to go down the pathway of this guilty conscience and to totally out of sync with God. We're able to have peace with God. We're able to have the peace of God ruling and presiding in our hearts all for a settled mind number two it says to the which also ye are called in one body in other words you recognize that you and other believers are all part of one body and you make decisions in favor of that unity you maintained the bond of unity so you maintain that and the bond of peace you're all of one body. Make decisions. You know that there's some people and they are able to make a stir. I don't know if anyone's been born into your family that just has that little twinkle in their eye and they look at their mother and they look at their father and they say, I know how I could start World War III right now. And they turn and they would just bring up the most contentious issue. And the little nine-year-old knows that mommy and daddy might have different opinions on this. And so they will just come right out with it and they just say a little bit of something, a little bit of something of that. Or if there's two fellas, you know how it is. They get home from 
you know, right on the stroke of midnight, because that's the curfew, of course. And uh, nothing spiritual happens after midnight. You do know that, right? Okay. So the boys are coming in at midnight, and the one turns to the mother and says, ha, ha, you should have seen him and who he talked to all evening. So, of course, what does the mother do? I beg your pardon. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. You'd love her, mom. I'm sure she's great. What girl have you been talking to? Where is she in fellowship? Does she know the things of the Lord? Does she? You know how it all goes. Mothers are a wee bit overreactive. You know how it is. And it's just, oh, I here's an expression, a pot stirrer. You ever heard of one of those? They don't all live in Northern Ireland. But plenty do. <laughs> and they just stir the, you know what this is saying? Let the peace of God rule in your hearts you do things that make for peace. If you know that you will annoy your brother by bringing up this topic in the Bible reading, don't do it. If you know that you will cause your sister to be offended by saying something about such and such, now I know there's things that need to be corrected. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about things that annoy. If you know how to annoy people, stop it. We want the peace of God. To rule here in our hearts in fellowship with him. And all of us called in one body in fellowship with one with the other. I'll tell you, there's a third thing here. It helps the peace of God for sure. Be thankful. Be thankful for what you have. It actually stops you from being jealous. I am so thankful for what I have. I am so thankful. I'm even talking materially. I am so thankful. I have been in countries where people don't have near what you have. Be thankful. I am so thankful for the little role that God has given me. Do other men have a better role, a bigger role, a more important role, a bigger gift? Yes. But if I'm thankful that I'm even given something at all, it'll stop the envying. It'll stop the jealousy. It'll stop me getting after others. You know, most of our nitpicking of others is that we're not thankful for what we have ourselves. It provokes a jealousy and an envy. And so I just call this the blanket of peace. I've even calmed down a little bit in my preaching. Just to give you that, three of you have gone to sleep, but just to give you that nice little blanket feeling, just to just put it on you, just to say, you be with the peace of God presiding, it'll help you and settle your mind. It'll settle you with the brethren. And you just be thankful. You say, is there any more? I've been standing here in front of the mirror and I'm not feeling too well. I've been, I've been getting all these things on and I've got my accessory on. and I've got this blanket to just keep me down. Is there anything else? Oh, yes, there is. Verse 16. Let's start again on this. The words here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You will notice as I read it, I punctuated it different than the King James Version. So here's how I read it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, semicolon. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, comma. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, erasing the comma, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So I see three distinct things here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Be filled with the words of Christ. And then using those words in all wisdom, teach and admonish one another. There has to be some wisdom in the way we apply the words. Otherwise, we're just going to get everybody all upset. And you're hammering away at your favorite doctrine. You're hammering away at your favorite scripture. And everybody knows what you're going to say, for example, in the assembly. Because you've been saying it for 30 years. And you think it's the only thing written in the Bible. You've got to use some wisdom. And so here you are, saturated with the word of God. You'll only get that way if you read it. You'll only get that way if you enjoy it. You only get that way if you meditate on it. Some people read three chapters a day and get through the whole Bible in a year. And there's others that tell me that they read a book continually through until it just doesn't seem to be as fresh anymore. And so they might read through Colossians 14, 15 times. And then they'll go on to the next book. And then they'll go on to the next. But it's a regular reading. I do suggest Genesis to Revelation. 
Just a wash. Genesis to Revelation. Just keep going. Genesis to Revelation. You say, Jeremiah. Jer I know what Jeremiah is like. That's why I give him maybe just a little bit of shorter time. And I just read it and 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 get it done. Pardon me to Mr. Jeremiah. But just, I, I, I'm going to read it. But I don't always spend as long a time. And some people I know, they only read three or four verses. And they meditate on it. And they make it their own. I don't know how it's going to benefit you. We all eat food differently, don't we? For some of us, two burgers and a sausage, six and a half minutes. And for some of you, I noticed, you actually ate it in a more polite manner, okay? And we savor things differently and we enjoy things. And when it comes to the word of God, whether it's going to be speeding through it and just being a wash, just make sure the word of Christ dwells in you richly. Just let it saturate your soul and then use it to teach and to help one another. Use it. And then it says in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Oh, you say, this is tremendous. We've got, we've got the word of God coming in. We've got the word of God going out. We've got the heart with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. And I'm sure all you brethren can distinguish the three different aspects of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I can't. But if you can do it, that's good. But I would suggest that maybe there's some of the whole Old Testament there in the psalms. And, and hymns might be worship. To, to God and, and spiritual songs include everything else about experiences. Maybe, oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my savior and my God. Maybe that's a spiritual song. Maybe it's a hymn. Regardless, start singing. Oh, I don't need to tell you that. You're good at that. Well done. Keep it up. My wife and I made it our business that we are going to sing after we re read. We are going to sing a hymn after every time we read the scriptures together. Unfortunately, we lived in a ground floor of an apartment and all the other members of the apartment did not appreciate the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, nor did they think we were singing with grace. I don't know what they thought, but have you ever heard windows slam and doors banged and that? And so Ruth and I gave that up. So now we just sing for an hour and a half on Sundays only, you know, in a detached dwelling. But you just sing. It's great to sing. You get the word in, help one another. Oh, you say, this is, this, this is just daily living. Is this really what God wants? How is this going to be for his greatness? Oh, I tell you, we're going to submit to one another. We're going to submit to one another in, uh, because we know how great Christ is. We're going to do everything in word or deed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thankful hearts. We're going to go day by day, simply living. And we're going to talk to the wives. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and don't be too harsh with them. That's what the bitterness here is. It's being a bit too harsh on them. Not that this would ever happen. There wouldn't be a woman that wouldn't be submissive to her husband. No, no, that would never happen. And there would never be a husband here that would just get a bit cantankerous with his wife. Would there? Would there? I think I'll take a drink of water at this point. Cool myself down. Because I've noticed there's a lot of red faces. And it's not just the sun. Here's where we can fall down, isn't it? There is a God-given role. I would just like to point out that I know no other place for true equality of a man and a woman than in a marriage. You say equality. Marriage is designed by the man to put the woman down and into the ground. And the, not God's way. And the various movements of our world would try to liberate the woman from this patriarchal institution called marriage. You be very careful about embracing that. Because as soon as the women are taken out from under the protection of a responsible male, they are now in jeopardy of being treated like in many countries in the world where the gospel has not touched. You will be treated dear woman, as a piece of property. And the man will do whatever he wants with any other woman he wants. And will, you will be held in bondage as a piece of his property. You see God's idea of a marriage? Perfectly equal. The woman is only for the man. The wife is only for the husband. And the husband is only for the wife. There is no other place where you see a true equality 
of a man and a woman, but in a marriage. So don't you ever forget that. Don't let the devil tell you that somehow we've got to go along with the Bible. and Somehow we've got to get through this. And what a dear woman, the dignity of your womanhood is enhanced in that relationship, not anything taken away from it. Because your husband has the same rights and responsibilities as you have. Privileges equal. Responsibilities equal to one another. It's just you do have a different role. There has to be leadership. There has to be leadership. That's why in an assembly, an elder is not a more important person. An elder is given responsibility. A man is not a more important person than a woman. It's just that he's been given the responsibility of providing the leadership and the woman is to come alongside. You notice it says, as is fit in the Lord. So if the man is asking the woman to do something that is not right and not in the Lord, I think she is well within her scriptural bounds of disobeying. Because it's to be in the Lord. So we don't have a tyrant. We have a loving husband manifesting the love of Christ to his wife with tremendous respect, not being bitter, not being harsh, not being hard, not speaking abruptly, not speaking down to her, not snapping his fingers, expecting things to be done for him. She's his help. And they're able to work together. And it's a very wise man. My wife told me this. It's a very wise man if you listen to your wife. Actually, Mr. Norman Crawford, whom I've quoted at least three or four times, he just said to me before I was married, and he pointed it at the girl that I was about to marry. He says, you see her? You listen to her. It's a wise man that listens. And there's plenty of scope in submission to have a robust discussion as to what should be done. And sometimes you'll change your mind and this and that. But ultimately, the man is held responsible. Don't forget that, dear sister. But out of love, he'll listen to you and he'll find out what your fear and your concern is and he'll honor you and you will submit to his leadership. Oh, you say that would bring about a plenty of harmony. So it would. And your children obey your parents in all things. This is well pleasing unto the Lord. Oh, what's a child? I think if you're still living at home and they're still making decisions for you, you're a child. So obey them. Now, I'm on very sticky ground here because mine moved back home when during COVID. So I don't know what to say anymore about this. They're not children, but it is my house. And, uh, well, you let me work on that one, shall we? Okay. But children will be, see the harmony? But you fathers, fathers, don't be pressurizing and provoking your children making them want to give up. Don't exasperate them. They might lose heart. Be kind. Can't help but remember, I was doing some homeschooling of the boys and uh, one little boy, he couldn't have been more than about nine years old. And I remember taking his little story he wrote and I said, what's the hypothesis? Mm, well, I said, what's the whole point of this? And look, you don't have the introduction right. You don't have the conclusion right. The body is looking a bit shabby itself. And we need to do this. And I had blood all over the paper. I had the red pen out and all this, had it all. Now I said, listen, you've got to learn to write your essays properly. You'll never be anything amounting to anything in life unless you can write a 10-page essay as a little boy and blah, blah, blah. And I just had it all. You know how it is. And I just laid it all out. He goes, but daddy. I said, don't but daddy me. I'm not treating you any different than I treated any of my students. But daddy, you taught university and I'm in P4. <laughs> Silly father. Silly father. Making them lose heart. So we want our children to obey. But we want to have kind fathers. Wise fathers will know what I'm talking about. We don't always get it right. Servants and masters. Servants. Why? You notice that there's five verses, four verses here about servants. Why do you think the book of Colossians talks about servants a whole lot more than Ephesians does? Because the book, of, the book of Philemon is linked with this one. And it's all about Onesimus, the slave. 
I won't say too much more about that, but those of you that know your Bibles, you can go and look and see, ah, oh, he's preparing the whole assembly, but he's also prepared. There's a big issue in this assembly. It's on a runaway servant. And it's a runaway servant that's being put back to a Christian master. He's got saved, Anisimus has, and he's going to go back to the master. Oh, well, we're going to, he's just making sure. Now you make sure, servants, this is not just like a, just doing things when your boss is looking, like not with eye service. You with singleness of heart, be a Joseph, fearing God in your heart. Do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men. All of you, all of you, all of you in employment. You're not just getting through. You're doing it with all of your heart. See, I feel like a slave around here. Amen. Servants, obey in all things your masters. Knowing that of the Lord, you're going to get a reward. You do a good, honest day's work. And you, that employer might not be very helpful and he might not be very kind, but you do a good day's work and you'll be rewarded by the Lord. And there's a unique expression here for ye serve the Lord Christ. I don't know whether I put a comma in that or whether that's just a title. Darby has it again in Romans 16, but in your King James Version, this is the only time. You're going to get a reward of an inheritance. Don't you worry about not getting paid enough here, brother. Don't you worry about getting paid, not getting paid enough here. I know there's proper and there's just uh, salaries and that, and, and you have every right to maybe ask and negotiate. I know all that, but look. This is not where your reward is. Your reward is because you are serving the Lord Christ. But don't think because you're a Christian that you'll get away with anything. He says, he that doeth wrong, you'll be punished. Of course you will. No respect of persons. So there's four verses that I've just skimmed over for the servants. And then masters, you just give what is just and equal. I was quite impressed recently when I heard that arbitrarily without any legislation or anything, a brother who owns quite a number of factories that are doing very well, he called in all the employees and he just raised their all their wages. He says, none of you are going to be paid the minimum wage or the living wage. Their work didn't change. He just upped their pay because he knew he was benefiting from their hard work. I thought that's a good Christian master. That's a good Christian employer. Here's actually slaves and masters. The slave is to do it as unto the Lord. The master is to do it work and to treat his servants knowing he has a master. See, isn't that lovely? The slaves are not working for a human master. They're working for the Lord. And the masters are not just human masters. They're actually the Lord's bond slaves. And this is the way God keeps us humble. This is the way, because we all want to show how great Christ is. Therefore, we must give deference to his greatness. And what does the Bible say? Submit yourselves one to another. That's the secret. You submit to Christ. Submit to one to another.